Hey, it's Joe Lyons from The Automator. Yesterday I was on a call with Raptor X and Maestrieth, and earlier in the day we were having some issues with an HTML GUI that we were displaying, and it was just acting funny, and Raptor X had tried a couple things, get it to, to use the CSS. It was really weird when we would save it as a file and display it in the IE browser, it looked fine. Yet when we would keep it in memory and just display it in ActiveX view, it didn't look good. There was something wrong with it. And so we asked Maestrieth if he had any ideas, and he gave us this function, um, and then we had fixed it, but then later on we were on a call with him and we said, hey, why don't you go through and, you know, explain this for us? Because we didn't, um, even though we used it, we didn't really walk into what it was doing and why it was needed and um, how to use it. So that's what this video is on, showing how to use that IE fix function. It turns out it was actually from Geek Dude uh, originally, and I looked it up on his his uh, GIST thing, and it was like six years old. But anyway, it works great. So if you're ever trying to display something, this is a great way to control the level of ie and the things it has available to it cheers from memory it didn't load properly right but what yeah. oh maestro yeah, yeah okay. maestro created this function maybe he can explain a little bit better yeah, what it does. actually to give right. credit where credit's due that's geek dude's function and ah. uh, yeah i usually normally put that in the comment i apologize for that but yeah, basically all it okay. does is it goes in and uh, tells whenever you create an internet explorer control make sure that you use a certain version so that um, like CSS and other compatibility issues are not as prevalent as what it is in, by default because for some reason Windows by default starts it up in uh, version 7 and for the life of me I don't get it but it's for you know legacy stuff so that yeah a lot of people... they're just supporting old computers and then make sure you show up what is it 139 and 142 how, how right. it's used so yeah, so basically um, what we do first is that we use the function, set the, uh, to the version that we need, in this case would be version 11, which is the, low, the, the, the highest at the moment. Um, and it would set it up, uh, I, it seems to me that the it function returns, returns the, current the version. Exactly, so the, the, the function returns the current version. We just save that up. We create the control with that version, and then right there we, reinstate the older version that we had so that the computer that we we don't leave the computer with a different oh, state right here here even though maestro i know you said it we don't want to be especially in other people's computers we don't want to be changing their registry right that's right. not a good idea but why wouldn't i just make this change on my computer and then Keep be done like with it <laughs> because i've I have personally run into some issues where I do not use it because it breaks certain oh, instances. Of stuff. There are certain types of programs that I or scripts that I've written that putting putting it up to eleven actually broke everything. I was like, uh, no. <laughs> no, no. The other the other reason why I wouldn't do that is because then you have it set up like that. You create a script that works on your machine. And as soon as you give it to somebody else, it will not work because on their machine, they do not have version 11. So it is like, yeah, it works for me, perfect. But as soon as I uh, share it, um, be it for, for testing or for something that you want to, to show them or whatever, it will automatically break just because they have a different version in their computer and not work. Yeah, I was just heard because the majority of the stuff that I end up writing, I don't, I mean, even though I share a lot of stuff, the majority isn't shared, right? The majority I just run. So I was just curious why I wouldn't make that one-time change. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I get you. Um, yeah. Better to yeah, not have to it's remember. It's always best practice to leave it as you found it. Well, but, yeah. and, and that was why the fact that you can change it and actually have it sticky, to me, it, it, but and I get your point though, it's like sometimes it breaks and so you don't want that and so you might yeah. as well leave it at the dumbed down version, which I guess uh -huh. gets back to because that's what everybody else is at. Right, that that's the, case, the point, right, yeah. right, right, right. So it, it would, it, the best idea is just keep it at the default for everybody. That's the idea. Just use the good stuff for what you need and let everybody else do with what they want. Exactly. <laughs> awesome, well, thanks, thanks guys for this was, uh, it was a lot longer of a path than I had anticipated, but um, <laughs> very interesting and l learned lots of good little stuff. Thanks for watching that video.
And I suppose you know already, we have a bunch of Udemy courses on AutoHotKey. I think there's five at the moment. We have a couple more releasing soon. I highly encourage you to go through the courses. Here's some main points. First one is AutoHotKey is such a vast topic. It gets really confusing on where to start. And by going through the Udemy course, you have a very clear flow of where to start and where to go. Another great thing is that each video is like three to eight minutes long. They're usually very short. You know, one of the psychological things you find is if you actually pay for something, then you will actually do it, right? So if you purchase it, then you will increase the likelihood that you'll actually follow up and do it. And that's one of the reasons why to, uh, to pay for it. There's also a money back guarantee with every Udemy course you buy. So there's really no risk. I have over 10 years programming without a hotkey. The other really big thing is I'm not a programmer, which clearly you know from watching these videos. Uh, so I don't come at things in a confusing way, and I explain them very clear uh, for a layman, uh, someone who doesn't program often. Given over 50 webinars, and I have over 100 podcasts uh, teaching on a hotkey. I'm going to have over 800 free videos here on YouTube. And of course, by purchasing a course, you help fund my channel. Therefore, I will create more videos and have more things for you. So please consider buying the course. Thank you.